All right, yesterday we went over properties of waves and we looked at how a lot of the terminology that we learned in both circular motion and simple harmonic motion okay, applies to waves. That would be things like period, frequency, amplitude, okay, uh, how they apply to that, how wavelength applies, okay, things like that. And then at the end of the day, okay, the last thing I kind of left off with was this idea about um, how the frequency and period of a wave What? Never change. Okay? The frequency and or the period of a wave is controlled by the source of that wave. Whatever produced it is what determined its frequency and period. Therefore, once that wave is produced, that frequency and or period is permanent. Okay? Other properties of a wave can change. Right? When a wave goes from one medium to another, so let's say it goes from air to water, its speed is going to change because the medium or the properties of the medium affect the speed of the wave. We looked at that yesterday when we were talking about um, the, uh, the tidal waves and how when they get close to shore, they, they get taller because they get shorter because they slow down. Okay? When the speed changes, the wavelength changes, the amplitude changes, but frequency never changes. Okay, and frequency never changes now to this period. Okay, everybody follow me there? All right, that is governed, kind of, by the universal wave equation. Now, the universal wave equation looks like this. V equals F times lambda. All right, so the speed of a wave is calculated by multiplying the frequency of the wave by the wavelength. It can also be written this way. It only appears that way on your formula sheet, though. Okay? Because we understand that t equals 1 over f and f equals 1 over t. Okay? Um, so it's only shown this way on your formula sheet. All right. Now, if we manipulate that formula so that instead of solving for v, it solves for f, we get this. And this is why the frequency of a wave will never change. If the speed changes, like let's say it gets slower, what happens to the wavelength? Think about the tidal wave we talked about yesterday. As it's approaching the shore, it slows down and gets shorter. So when this number gets smaller, so does this number by exactly the same factor which means that number will mathematically not change. Okay? If the speed gets cut in half, so does the wavelength. Okay? Then these numbers are both half as big as they used to be, and their ratio, which is what you get by dividing them, remains the same. Okay? Thus, the frequency of the wave will never change. Okay? Everybody, does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Now, this is important because this is something we see and hear in everyday life. Right? If I'm, let's say, at like a... Uh, a swimming pool, okay? And I'm looking at, let's say, like a, a red colored light that's for whatever reason up on the ceiling. When I'm above the water, the light looks red. If I go under the water and look up at it from under the water, does it still look red? Yeah. Yes. Because the color of the light has to do with the frequency of the light, okay? And the frequency doesn't change just because the light goes from air to water. Its speed changes, its wavelength changes, but its frequency remains the same. The same is true for sound. Okay? This is really important if you're like a synchronized swimmer, okay? if you've ever watched synchronized swimming. Okay? Sometimes some of the people on the team are above the water, and some of them are under the water. But they have to be synchronized, hence the name, okay? synchronized swimming. And they're doing this to music. Well, that means that the music above the water and the music that's being piped in through the underwater speakers needs to be in time, and it needs to sound the same. Okay? And it does, because the frequency, the pitch of the sound, doesn't change, even if it's underwater. Okay? There is one problem, but it's not usually a big problem because pools are small. But sound travels way faster underwater than it does in air, about five times faster okay, underwater. So if the pool was like really, really big, there could be a problem with how quickly the people under the water would hear the sound versus the people on top, and they could get out of sync. But the pool would have to be really big. Okay, for that to be a factor. 
Okay. All right. So it's making sense so far. All right. Is this going to be a hard formula to use? Like this is mathematically as easy as b equals d over t because that's really what it is. Okay. If we look at this, b equals lambda, which is in meters over period, which is in seconds. It's really b equals d over t. It's how long it takes to travel one wavelength. Okay. So it still is d over t. The trick with these kind of questions is context and wording. They can be very tricky. I'm going to show you the tricks. You just have to remember the tricks. Okay. All right. So how fast does a traveling wave move? Well, we could do a couple of things to calculate that. We could measure how far it travels and how long it takes to travel that far and go V equals D over T. Problem is that's kind of hard to do with waves because they're not like definite in shape all the time. Like if I'm watching a water wave, you know, I can kind of watch the crest, but the crest is going to change shape. Water waves change shape as they go through the, through the water. It'd be hard to kind of track that. Plus, what are my reference points? Unless I have a couple of buoys sitting in the water for it to travel between, I don't really have a good frame of reference to measure distance and measure time and all of that. So B equals D over T would certainly work, but it would be difficult to use. Okay. So instead, okay, we can use the uh, wave, wave equation instead. All right. So um, as we approach, this is kind of to do with what we were talking about yesterday. Okay. As a wave approaches the shore and the depth of the water changes, the properties of the medium, the water, change. Okay. In other words, there's less of it because it's not as deep. Right? And that's going to affect the speed of the wave. And as you saw in the video yesterday, when the depth of the water reaches a depth of about half the length of the wave, the wave transforms from a, like a surface going wave, a deep ocean wave, to a shallow water wave, which means it, its shape becomes more defined and it'll eventually start to break okay, and then kind of come up on the shore. Okay, everybody with me there? It's kind of the diagram of what that guy was talking about yesterday. Okay, I don't remember what this one was. Okay, so if we're dealing with waves, it's easier to use the properties of the wave to calculate its speed. Right? So we've got V equals lambda over T. Okay? That'll calculate it, or as it's written on your formula sheet, uh, F times lambda. Okay. Everybody good with the formula? Okay. Now, let me ask you this. I'm going to go back to this blank page. There are five crests on the diagram I just drew. How many wavelengths are there? Four. Okay. Four. There are four wavelengths. Five crests. There are only four complete cycles of the wave. Okay. From here to here is one wavelength. From here to here is one wavelength. From here to here is one wavelength. And from here to here is one wavelength. Okay? So while there might be five crests, there are actually only four complete cycles because this first crest is where we start counting. It's zero. Right? Zero, one wavelength, two wavelengths, three wavelengths, four wavelengths. Okay? This is one of the tricks played on you with a universal wave equation question. Lots of times a universal wave equation will say so-and-so is in a boat and they count six crests going by in five seconds. And you have to understand that that doesn't mean six waves went by, it means five waves went by. It's always one less okay, than the number of crests or drops, because sometimes it says drops go by. Okay. Now, similarly, here's another context uh, question you could get. Person is on a boat, and the boat bobs up and down five times. Now, how many waves went by? Four. Five. Five. Because they went up and down five times. That's five complete cycles. Okay? Does everyone follow the difference there? Okay. If it says they do this up and down, then they went through a complete cycle, however many times they said they did it. Okay? But if they only counted crests and troughs, it's always one less than that number. 
Okay, so it's one of the little tricks that can get played. All right. Um, okay, I'm going to wait to do the other contextual trick here for a minute. Okay, so easy formula to use. Okay, you get an easy question like this: A sound wave has a frequency of 262 hertz and has a wavelength of 1.29 meters. What's the velocity of the wave? Well, you just plug in the numbers into the universal wave equation. 1.29 meters times 262 hertz is 338 meters per second. That is roughly the speed of sound probably in this room right now. Okay? Usually around 20 degrees Celsius at like you know, reasonable one atmosphere pressure. Okay? That's about 340. We're at a fairly high altitude, and it's a little, it's about 20 in here. That would be about right. Is that fast? Okay. Like it seems fast, but can we tell the limitations of the speed of sound pretty quickly? Like when lightning, when you see lightning, you don't <coughs> usually hear the thunder right away unless the lightning is hitting right next to you, in which case you have bigger worries about how long it took between the lightning and the thunder. Okay, um, but most of the time, it can be several seconds before you hear the thunder. And in fact, that's how you can figure out how far away the lightning struck. Right? If, if uh, the sound travels at 338 meters per second, that means it takes roughly three seconds for it to go one kilometer. Okay. 338 meters per second, roughly one third of a kilometer, right? Each second. That means it takes three seconds for it to go one kilometer, right? So if you see the lightning and then one second later, okay, you hear the thunder, that was close. It was about 300 meters away, okay? But if it was three seconds, it was like a kilometer away. Okay. Everyone all right with that? All right. Um, so another example here. Let's have you write that one down and give it a try. It's like what I was just telling you. Okay, so let's have you try that one with the six crests, and then I'm going to tell you about the other type of contextual trick you might encounter. Okay, so in this one here, okay, a person is sitting on a dock. She notices that in 30 seconds, six crests pass by. Okay, what can I find with that? I can find frequency, four period, whichever one, okay? Um, but I have to remember that six crests means five waves. Okay, so in five, in, in 30 seconds, five waves go by, okay? So if I want uh, cycles per second frequency, I'm gonna go um, five waves divided by 30 seconds. That'll give me waves per second or hertz. Okay, so when I do that, Okay, five divided by 30, I'm getting a frequency of 0.16 repeating hertz. And that makes sense because it's definitely less than one wave per second if only five go by in 30 seconds. Okay, so 0.16 hertz. All right, the other thing they tell me is that the distance between the crests is four and a half meters. What did they give me? Lambda. Lambda, right, they gave me a wavelength. Okay, so lambda is 4.5 meters. What's the speed of the waves? V equals F times lambda. Okay, so 0.16 times the wavelength, 4.5. Okay, we punch that into our calculator. So times 4.5. Those waves are moving at 0.75 meters per second. Okay, everybody all right with that? Okay. Let's see if we put the next one here. Okay, this is the next contextual trick, but I want to see if you figure it out first. Okay, so a hiker yells at a cliff because you know cliffs get in the way, and that's frustrating. Okay. They yell at a cliff and they hear the echo three and a half seconds later. On this day, the temperature is 22 degrees Celsius. How far away is the cliff now? This is the one thing you don't know yet, and it's this formula. It's on your formula sheet. V equals 332 plus 0 0.6 times temperature. Okay, This will calculate the speed of sound in air of any temperature, Okay, even if it's below zero. Right? You just plug in whatever the temperature is in degrees Celsius for T, 
and do this and you will have the speed of sound on that in that particular air, right? That is not the contextual trick for this question. It's just one more formula you need to know to use, all right? Is T in degrees Celsius? T is in degrees Celsius always, yeah. All right, I'll give you a few minutes, see if you figure that one out. Uh, no, actually, the 3.5 seconds is a time. It has nothing to do with period or frequency. Um, one full wavelength could be from the sound going from you back to you, and distance of the clip would be half that. Okay, so yeah, not the wavelength, but yeah, the distance it tra the distance to the clip is half the distance traveled by the sound because the echo goes there and back. And they told you how long it was before he heard the echo. So the sound had to go there and back. What do I have to do with the time? Divided by two. Okay. So in this question here, the first thing I want to do, obviously, is calculate the speed of sound in the air for that particular day. So 332 plus 0.6 times 22, right? 345.2 meters per second is my speed of sound. Okay. The time is going to be three and a half divided by two, so that'll be 1.75 seconds, okay, just to get to the cliff. And then I can calculate the distance. D equals V times T. Was this even a universal wave equation question? Now, what I would usually do is put in a part B, like what was the, now that you know the, uh, you know, the speed of the wave, if the, uh, you know, frequency was this, what was the wavelength, or something like that. I'll just throw in some, you know, simple kind of wave equation calculation after that. So we take our 345.2 and we multiply it by 1.75. All right, so the cliff is 600 meters away. 600, I think we only have two significant digits, so 6.0 times 10 to the 2 meters. All right, so echo questions, something to watch for. Okay, that could be a hiker yells at a cliff, which sounds crazy, and it probably is. Okay, or it could be like, you know, a submarine is, um, you know, measuring the depth of the water using sonar. Is sonar still a, an echo? Right. The sound waves travel to the ocean floor, and then they come back up. It's still an echo. Okay, or a bat, okay, uses echolocation to find its food. Okay, so it makes the high-pitched screeching noise that we basically can't hear. The sound waves bounce off of the food and come back, okay, and then it knows where it is. So, um, you know, things like that, they're all echo questions. And we just have to remember the context of an echo question is that the sound travels to the reflective surface and back. Okay. All right. All right, try that one. Just a universal wave equation problem. Okay, so all we have to do on this one, okay, we know the frequency is two hertz. Okay, we know the speed is 5.40 meters per second, right? And we're simply looking for lambda, right? So all we have to do is manipulate V equals F times lambda for lambda by dividing both sides by F. Plugging in our numbers means 5.4. Okay, divided by 2, which should be 2.7 meters okay, as our uh, wavelength there. Very good with that one. Okay, we just did one like number 1, but I would like you to try 2 and 3, please. So number two with the submarine, okay, uh, we know the frequency is 325 hertz, okay, and the sound wave bounces off the underwater rock face and returns to the submarine eight and a half seconds later, which means it only took four and a quarter seconds to get to the bottom, all right, so time is 4.25 seconds, and they tell me that the wavelength is 4.71 meters. If I'm going to figure out how far it is to the bottom, what other thing do I need? Velocity. I need speed. Yeah, I need the speed of the waves. So, can I find the speed of the waves if I know frequency and wavelength? I can. Okay. So the speed of the waves is V equals F times 
times lambda. Plug in our numbers here, 325 times 4.71, okay, and we'll get the speed of sound in water. 325 times 4.71, 1530.75 meters per second. Sound travels way faster underwater than it does in air. All right, so now that we've got that number, now I can find out how far away the bottom of the ocean is by going D equals B times T, All right? So I take my um, 1530 that I just calculated and I multiply it by the four and a quarter seconds. Okay. 6.5, uh, 6.51 times 10 to the three meters. Very deep. It's like the Laurentian abyssal or something really deep. Yeah. Okay. Any other ones there, guys? We do okay with the fishermen and the. It's in 3D, I have to find uh, the uh, frequency to, by dividing the waves by seconds. I think. Uh, yes. Okay. You do, and you have to turn, convert the minutes to seconds. Yeah. 180 seconds. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, so we won't actually do this question, but we'll talk about what the kind of trick is with it. So two turning forks are generating sound waves with a frequency of 384 hertz. The waves from one tuning fork are generated in air, where the speed of sound is 350 meters per second, and the other tuning fork is generating sound underwater. Um, well, this isn't the trick to the question. I've never seen a tuning fork work underwater. Okay. The viscosity of the water very quickly dissipates the vibration of the tuning fork. Okay. Actually, if you put a tuning fork and you, you hit it and then you put it near the water, it splashes everywhere because the vibration caused it to do that. Okay, Would you hear the same musical note underwater as you did in air? What property of a wave never changes? Frequency. Frequency. doesn't matter whether it's underwater or in the air. It's going to sound the same, I mean obviously our ears don't work as well underwater, but the pitch of the sound is going to be the same, right? And that's why they went through the whole bother here of going, the speed of sound in air is this much, the speed of sound underwater is this much, calculate the wavelength. They're gonna have different wavelengths. The wavelength underwater is gonna be way bigger, five times bigger, okay, than it is in air. That's what's gonna keep the frequency the same, okay? It's at both tuning forks are emitting the same frequency. It doesn't matter whether it's in, set, in, in air or underwater, the frequency is going to be 384 hertz. Okay. All right, I have a few universal wave equation questions from the workbook, guys, that I want you to work on here, and then that'll be it because it's not too difficult stuff. I would like you guys to do, let's say, um, two, three, Let's see. 
13. Now, one little thing I will tell you here, guys, is some of these questions um, are a little bit tricky in their givens. Obviously, the, the math is easy in all of them, okay? but there's um, some contextual tricks in there. And that has to do with when you're dealing with a light wave or an electromagnetic wave or a microwave or any of those kinds of waves, how fast do they go? Microwave, electromagnetic wave, light wave, all travel at the speed of light. Okay? The speed of light is a given on your formula sheet. It is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Okay? So anytime a question is talking about an electromagnetic wave, a microwave, a radio wave, okay, whatever, it's talking about light. Okay? Those are all light waves, so they all travel at the speed of light. Okay, sound waves, that's different. They might give you the speed of sound, they might give you the temperature, and have you calculate it, whatever. Okay, but just know that anything electromagnetic is light. Okay. Is there any, like, um, would, there, would you be able to have, like, a, um, a slow motion camera that would be able to capture someone turning on a light and, like, to see the light going and, like, putting it on? No. Probably not. The number of frames per second. That would it have does that happen though when you turn on the light? Does it? Yep. Oh. You, we just can't detect it because it's so that, that speed, yeah, it's it's instantaneous. And for a lot of for a lot of years, people thought that light just traveled instantaneously because that's all they ever experienced. Right. Right. It's not like sound where if they shot a gun, it was a few seconds later before they heard the sound. Yeah. Okay. Like Newton, when he first, I think it was Newton, who first tried to calculate the speed of light, he had a buddy go four kilometers away with a lamp, and then like turned on the, like, uncovered the lamp, and then he tried to time how long it took the, the light to get to him, so it was, it was ridiculous. Yeah. Like, um, in fact, it's one of the first things you do in, in Physics 30 is you go over all the different methods used to calculate the speed of light. They used when one of the moons of Jupiter appeared versus when it should appear. Um, they had this uh, mirrored wheel that they bounced the light around so that it had to travel an incredible distance before it could exit the apparatus, and they would try and use that. That was actually one of the better ones, the Michelson uh, experiment, I think it was. Okay. But you learn all of that in the electromagnetic waves unit. That's why this unit is so important. It gives you the basis for waves, so you can do all the stuff with light in physics 30. All right, um, I can't make that a whole lot bigger. Um, so you will have to probably have a look at it on your own phone there, okay? But I'll scroll it up after a few minutes, after two and three here.